All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here so early in the morning. Um, welcome to Networking, the Art of Making Intentional Connections, featuring Dr. Felicia Full of Love. Uh, my name is Christine Skaggs. I'm going to be introducing the speaker today. I will also be providing technical support. So if you have any issues, feel free to shoot me a private message in the chat, um, and I will work to handle the situation. Uh, my colleague, Hannah Zimmerman, is going to be uh, moderating today. Um, and so you can also send her private messages as well if you are too embarrassed to you know, put it in the general chat function. We are requesting that your cameras and microphones remain off during the entirety of the session unless otherwise specified. I believe um, Dr. Fuller Love though is planning on doing a sort of interactive uh, session. So she may decide to ask you guys to, to put cameras on um, as she begins. Uh, otherwise, please feel free to type your questions into the chat and we'll get to them. Um, at the very end, in the Wuhuva app, you will see that there is a survey. Please take the opportunity to fill those out. I don't know if you've been seeing them, but you can go back to previous events and fill that out uh, to make sure that we are effectively providing sessions that you want to see. And so now I will introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Felicia Fullalove is a program manager for the American Chemical Society. She is also a former policy fellow at the National Science Foundation. Uh, where she has worked towards broadening the participation of groups historically underrepresented um, in STEM fields. And she has a lot of expertise in communicating scientific concepts to technical and non-technical audiences. This is one of the main reasons when we were uh, looking for people that uh, we had found her. She's also participating in our mentorship program here locally. Um, and so she has, has definitely been able to um, effectively meet those goals. Um, and so I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Christine, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to thank you all for waking up this early to join me. I was convinced that it was going to be like me, Christine, and Hannah, and we were just going to chit chat <laughs> for about 45 minutes. Um, but before I get started with this presentation, I also want to uh, give a thank you and a shout out to a close friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Brandy Hutterson, who um, through conversations with her, uh, I was able to actually put this presentation together um, because we're both really interested in networking. And at the end, I'll kind of tell, talk more about myself and kind of my networking uh, journey and how it's impacted uh, my career. Like Christine said, I really want this to be interactive. I know it's early in the morning. I'm not going to ask you to turn on your cameras. But I will ask for you to interact with me um, in the chat. And there may be, if we have time, uh, a breakout rooms that you all can kind of do some uh, networking in uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so first, I like to kind of know who my audience is uh, before I start a presentation. So if possible, could you tell me a little bit about yourselves in the chat? So all I'm asking are, where, first, where are you on your professional journey? Are you an undergraduate student? Are you a graduate student, a postdoc? early career professional, mid-career professional, seasoned professional, um, and then one kind of fact about yourself. So if you can share that uh, in the chat, that would be really great, just so that I can get a feel for who you are, and we can also get a feel for who else is in the room with us here. So I am watching the chat. Oh, you guys are good and fast. So we have um, a number of graduate students and early career professionals. Um, we have people who like to cook, who have cats. Someone is planning a wedding. I'm also planning a wedding. <laughs> so Hannah, we can talk about that later. Um, a yogi, a sports enthusiast. I have two cats, that's great. I used to have a cat, I have a dog now. Um, my fact that I usually share is that I am a huge Harry Potter fan. Um, I read all of the books while I was in high school and in undergrad, saw all of the movies, cried at <laughs> the last kind of um, last Harry Potter movie before the Fantastic Beasts series started. Um, and I have feelings about Fantastic Beasts. We won't talk about that here. I also have feelings about... Um, the play, but again, I could talk about Harry Potter all day long. The reason why I do this icebreaker is because we're gonna talk about today networks and how to build networks. 
And one of the things that's really critical here is that networks are built around our interests. And so sometimes learning a fact about someone, you can quickly see like, hey, this is someone who I should connect to. This is someone that I may want to talk to later. Um, so we'll talk more about this uh, throughout the presentation. But we're going to start off with really thinking about what is a network. And so if we look at the look in the dictionary, we find that a network is kind of an interconnected group of uh, or association of persons. So your network could be friends, they could be uh, professional colleagues. I think most often when we think about a network, we're thinking about it, we're thinking about it in a very professional sense. But I don't want us to forget that your network can consist of your family, your friends, as well as your coworkers or individuals that you may know in a professional sense. I think we often forget that our family, however you, however you're, you define family, that your family is really your first initial network that you're introduced to in life, right? Those are the people who introduce you to other people. Um, and then your friends, I think sometimes we forget that people that we're close friends with also um, are, are part of our network and they can introduce us to other individuals. And so really a network functions to increase your access and amplify your reach, right? So your network can get you into rooms that you may not be traditionally be able to get into. Um, your network may be able to speak about you on a very much larger forum. And so people who do not know you may be able to learn about you through your network. And so again, you can have several different types of network. So you may have social networks, you may have a professional network, and you may have recreational networks. So for example, I used to live in Atlanta and I played softball. And so that was another network that I had that was outside of kind of my, more, my uh, chemistry world. It was a network of individuals that I had just learned through kind of playing softball. So why do we need to network? And I would like for you to kind of put in the chat some reasons that you think that networking may be important um, for you. Networking gets you a job. I would wholeheartedly agree with that, Christine. Um, again, I'll talk about my journey a little bit more. Other reasons why you may need to network. So you may be able to connect people, secure positions, a support system. I think that's very important. Um, it talks more. As an introvert, again, Ashley, we'll see that later on. I have a whole section about being an introvert in this presentation. Have other connections outside of school and work. Get you into doors to meet people throughout your career. Helps you win job, when jobs. Change, when changing jobs. Agree. I agree with all of these things that you all have said. And I think the number one thing that we think about when we're thinking about network is our professional growth, right? How can I get to that next step in my career? If I'm a student, you know, I may be looking for a job. How do I get to a job? I may have a job. I may be thinking about, I want to move to another job. How do I do that? Or you may be, you may find yourself in a position where you know, I'm at a position where I'm very comfortable with in my career, but I want to be able to connect other people. So when we think about a network, uh, we're thinking about that there's like different nodes and there's lines that connect to those nodes, right? And so maybe you want to be a connector. You want to think about how to connect other people. Another reason why we may why we need networks are for personal growth. Right. So it may not be necessarily, you know, I'm thinking about my next job, but it may be personal. Right. So let's say tomorrow I wake up and I want to learn how to play the violin. Right. I need to find other individuals who may play the violin, who may be able to assist me on my journey to playing the violin. And so that could be for my personal growth. Or it could be, let's say I want to become a better communicator. I want to become there may be some skills that I want to gain that are outside of necessarily my career, but I want to gain them for profession for my personal growth, right? That again is where a network can be very beneficial in helping you grow. Something that we don't really think about, and really, it wasn't until I was a graduate student that I really started to think about this, but networks also help us solve societal problems. So when we think about large grand challenges that exist globally, right? We could talk about climate change. We could talk about hunger. We could talk about income inequality. 
All of these kind of large societal problems also require networks to, in order to solve them, right? We cannot, as an individual, <laughs> might not be able to solve climate change, but as a network of scientists or as a network community, we can really think about how to approach climate change. How can we approach it from a position that is going to be, that is going to work for our community versus another community? And so this more kind of broad sense of why we need networks became very apparent to me um, as a graduate student. So one example is the National Science Foundation um, in the mid 2000s, they started funding these centers for chemical innovation. Um, and these centers, and some of you may have either worked as a part of the center or been engaged or heard about them before, but they are these large kind of networked communities of chemists and engineers who work together to solve grand challenges in chemistry. So for example, the center that my advisor was a part of was the Center for CH Functionalization. And really the ideal of these centers was to kind of change the way that we thought about how we did science. Right, so traditionally, if we think about, I'm a researcher, our research group has this focus and we are going to work on this problem. We may have a few collaborators out there, but we're really trying to pioneer this work in this area and make a name for ourselves. The problem is that for large problems, really this kind of siloed, um, this kind of siloed work doesn't actually help solve the problem. And so one of the things that National Science Foundation and other organizations uh, have, have also kind of used this approach of how do we bring groups of people together to solve that problem? So how do we change the way um, groups connect or co communicate with each other? We've also seen this um, more recently in some work that I've done with social networking and, real, and thinking about how do we bring groups together to solve problems related to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So how do we bring different community partners together to really make a change um, in that area. And so one of the things that I think is really kind of interesting and something that I, again, more recently learned um, is that networks are so important that there is an entire field of study dedicated to understanding how networks work in society, neuroscience and computer systems. So you can actually, there's like a few programs out there where you can get a PhD in network science. And really I kind of knew that this existed. I mean, we, I th we think about it a lot in kind of a computer systems way of like, okay, I know that there's networks, but really thinking about the neuroscience, cognitive networking, behavioral networking, societal networking, these are real things that a lot of scientists are looking into because they've started to recognize that collaboration and networking is are critical pieces to really bringing about change and uh, making a difference. So I wanna kind of walk through an example. Let's say that you are early career or even a graduate student and you wanna go find a job, right? And so when you're, on, you're out here looking for this job, you may think there's five easy steps to kind of starting my career. Step one, I'm gonna to go to school and I'm gonna get good grades. In fact, you may not get good grades, you may get great grades, you may get excellent grades. So you're gonna learn and gain valuable skills. Uh, while you are in school. Three, you're gonna create a resume that demonstrates really how smart you are. I mean, you're gonna have the best resume of all the resumes. Um, and you're gonna apply for, for your, your dream job. And when you apply for this dream job, of course, you're gonna get an interview. You're gonna kill the interview and you're going to accept the offer and like, bam, it works like this. Spoiler alert, for someone who graduated during the great economic depression of 2008, I'm gonna let you know, it does not work like this. In fact, um, I don't know anyone who's found a job kind of just like, oh, I went to school, I got good grades, I submitted a resume and I got an interview, I applied for the job and I got the job. No one I know has actually gotten a job this way. For all of them, it required that they networked at each of these stages. And so we'll talk about individually how networking can play a role in each of these stages of trying to look for a job. And so when we think about what a network can do for you, that network 
represents you, right? So your network can represent you in rooms that you're not in. Your network can represent you when they go out into other places, when they're meeting other people. They can act as a connector for you. They can advocate for you. I think this is very important that sometimes you need people that are able to not only advocate for you, but can sponsor you. And those are things that networks can do for you. They can share resource, resources with you to help you advance and vice versa. We'll talk about this more later, but it's really important that when you engage in kind of a networking relationship with someone, that this really is a mutually beneficial relationship, that both people are they're gaining something from it. If not, then that networking relationship may not last long, right? If you're just in the relationship to take, 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 and you're not getting anything in return, that relationship may actually not last very long. And so the last thing uh, that I would say that what a network can do is that a network can help you find job connections. We've said that a network can also get you access to a sold out event. I'm not going to lie. When you, when you think about your friends from undergrad, I'm sure they're not all chemistry majors. Some of them might've been marketing people and they may have access to events that you really want to get into and you can leverage your network to do things like that. So I think we often just think about our network from a professional sense, but we also need to think about from a social sense, how can our network better us and even get us connections uh, that we may not be able to get professionally. So what are your thoughts? I'm kind of interested in what you all think about networks and how uh, leveraging a network may be beneficial uh, for you. And if you feel, I mean, you can type in the chat, but also if you wanna come off screen and chat, that also works. We have plenty of time and I'm really interested to kind of see and hear what you all are thinking. So Anna saying that her network got her all three of her sabbaticals. My network actually got me all of my jobs that I've ever had. <laughs> so we'll talk about that later helps us learn new things outside of our field. I completely agree with that. I think that's a great way to leverage your network is to learn things outside of your field. My network got me an internship at my dream job that led to a full-time offer. It's great to hear. So I'm glad that more people are kind of realizing that networks are as important as being able, like you definitely have to have the resume, you have to have the skills, but that network will get you kind of one step. Um, further. All right. So, so we'll go back and you guys can continue sharing in the chat. I think these are kind of really great. And I, I agree, maintaining the network is the hard part. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit about how do you maintain that network. Uh, but let's kind of go back to what we were talking about, those five steps to getting your dream job, right? So theory was, I'm going to go to school, get good grades, I'm going to learn and gain these valuable skills. In reality, I'm going to go to school, I want to join groups that support my interests, or right? support your interests. And I think this is very, very, very important, right? Yes, we're in school or you go to school to get an education, to gain skills, but you really want to also make sure that you are um, cultivating your interests because those are actually going to teach you skills that you may not be able to learn in the classroom or in the laboratory. They're also going to help you connect to a broader network of people, right? So you're going to meet more people when you're involved in campus. You're going to be able to have more um, impact as well as a larger kind of impression of what happens on your campus or in your community. So the second thing is that, yes, you're going to learn and gain valuable skills, but you are going to apply those skills through your internships or through extra curriculums. Again, you're going to leverage your network to do that. You may use your network to get that internship. You may use your network to, to kind of engage in those extracurriculars, but your network is always kind of going to be there on your side while you move through uh, kind of your educational journey. So in theory, you're gonna create a great resume that demonstrates how smart you are. In reality, you're gonna create a resume that demonstrates how you've leveraged your skills. This is really, really important. 
I always, I, when I used to be a faculty member, I used to have students who would show me their resume and they would say, well, I don't want to put, you know, that I was involved in this or I was involved in that. I mean, it doesn't really apply to what I'm applying to. And I would say, well, didn't you learn how to lead teams by doing this? Didn't you learn how to uh, do logistics? So there are skills that you may not have learned in the classroom that you may have learned on a job or internship that you really want to make sure that you're showing on your resume. Additionally, you want to share that resume again with your network, with peers and with mentors that you can trust are going to give you valuable feedback uh, before applying for jobs. And often what I found is that I'm going to share my resume or, I, or a student would share their resume with me and I would say, hey, have you thought about this opportunity? Have you looked at this opportunity? Or I, I'm aware that, you know, this program is really looking to bring on a student with these skills. You should consider applying for this. And so I really think that being, I think sometimes we can hold things like our resume or personal statements very close to our chest because they're personal. But I think it's also very important to share those with individuals that you trust because if they are true network partners, if they are true advocates and sponsors and you know, accountability partners for you, then they're going to want to see you progress and they're going to help and share their network with you. So theory tells us that we're going to again, apply for your dream job. Again, you may apply for several jobs, uh, including your, your dream job, but you're really gonna leverage your network when you're applying for jobs. Again, I will say, I will, I have never, um, never not told people this, I will never not say this, but every job that I have taken has, networking has played a critical role in either me making sure that, hey, I applied for this position, I'm not sure if my application was received, or, you know, is there a way that I can talk to a current employee so that I can learn more about this organization so that I'm prepared for my interview? Again, networking allows for you to connect with potentially current employees so that you can really learn like, is that dream job really the dream job that I want? Is this an organization that I really want to work for? Uh, and maybe even you may be able to talk to the hiring manager. One thing that I've learned is that a lot of times um, hiring managers will go to other employees and say, hey, I have this position open. I'm really looking to fill, fill this. If you know anyone that fits these skills, like please like give them my information. I would love to chat with them, right? So this can be an informal interview really to kind of just gain to figure out if you are the person for that position. Um, but I always suggest that you try to get the inside scoop. You know, taking on a job or really applying for a job and accepting a job is a huge kind of thing in your career and making sure that you're at, you take a job that's the right fit for you. So again, in theory, you're gonna kill the interview and accept the offer. In reality, you are going to prepare for that interview and ask your network for help. You really need to ask your network. Anytime uh, my friends and I, if we have interviews coming up, we're like, hey, can we run through some questions together? Can you, you know, do you know someone who works in HR who may be able to kind of talk to me about things that I should be prepared for? What are follow-up questions that I should be asking? These are, this is why your network can act as a support system, right? They don't necessarily have to be in the same field as you, but they can still support you through this process. The other thing that this, um, that I would say is why networking is important is that if you are offered a job, negotiate, 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 negotiate. And really, I think this is a challenge. Um, and this is something that I'm still learning the importance of negotiating. But I've learned that by networking and talking to people who may be in similar positions, you will really start to get a feel for what should I be asking for? What should I be looking for in an offer? What are things that are really going to be important that may not be important to me now, but five years down the line may be really important to me? So I wanted to kind of go through that because I do think that sometimes we have kind of like idealistic thoughts in our minds about, you know, okay, I'm going to get this job and it's just going to be easy. No, it's going to require a lot of networking and talking to people. So this has come up a, cert a couple of times. Um, Yes, we understand networks are important, but the actual act of networking, that is the challenge. I 
percent agree. I am an introvert. You may not believe me, but in reality, I am 100% an introvert. I am not a fan of networking events. They make me anxious. They make me nervous. I'm always like, what am I supposed to do here? Am I going to have to have awkward conversations with people? So it has taken me a really kind of like trial and error of knowing what I feel comfortable with, what type of activities and what types of um, events I'm comfortable with attending, and also leveraging people that I know that may be much more extroverted than me. So Christina is saying her biggest anxiety is trying to start up a conversation with someone I don't know and haven't met. 100% agree. So actually my question here was going to be for everyone to kind of tell me, where are you on the networking spectrum? Some people are pros and they can like work any room. If you're there, God bless you. And maybe we can talk later about how I could become a pro. Um, are you okay at networking? You can attend an event and usually meet one to two new people. Are you a networking newbie? I like to expand my network, but I'm sure how. B, I do not enjoy networking. I try to avoid it at all costs. I definitely think at one point in my life, I was a D. Um, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm a B now. I used to be a D. I definitely was like, I don't want to attend any networking events. I hate it. I don't want to talk to people. I can meet a lot of people, but it is a total struggle. And I'm definitely wiped out at the end. B and B. So we're seeing, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of different, so a lot of people are feeling like B, they can meet people. But a lot of people are saying, I don't like to go up to people if I don't know them. I got you. I think it's weird also. I also, I struggle with that as well. And so we'll talk about kind of like, what are my tips? I'm going to give some tips as an introvert um, coming up next. But really, I want to talk about really quickly building your networks. So when we're building a network, we want that to be based upon something, right? We've talked about this. We want to be based upon your interests, your skills, or your experience. People are usually using their social and professional capital for your benefit. So they're endorsing your character, your work, or your skills. So think about that when you're connecting with people and really think about the relationship and how, how you can foster that relationship so that they can say good things about your character and not bad things, because I've definitely seen that kind of go both ways. Um, it's important that you use your network wisely. So be aware of how your network advocated for you because you are responsible for your network. I say this because I've heard of cases and I've actually known of cases of people who have applied for jobs um, and of course you give your references and your references are hopefully people that you can trust and they're going to say positive things about you, but you, someone on that hiring committee, they may know someone else that you used to work with and they may go to that person and say, Hey, do you know, X, Y, and Z, what can you really tell me about them? And I know of situations where people have had offers that were extended to them and that offer taken back because of things that they learned about the individual um, from their networks of just that this is really not the person, they're not representing themselves uh, properly. And so just be aware of that when you are connecting with people that you do wanna represent yourself and represent who you are um, to the full extent. So a lot of people have talked about that. They don't know what to talk about when they get to a networking event. They don't know how to foster those relationships. And so I wanna give a few tips from an introvert. And so I am a self-proclaimed introvert. I can sit in the house and watch TV and talk to myself all day if I had to. When I, I do not do well in large groups, it gives me a lot of anxiety. So my first intent, my first um, tip would be when you're going to a networking event, or even if you're just out at, you know, like this conference, you want to be intentional right? Really think about who is my audience? Who am I? What type of person or people am I looking to connect with, right? So if you go to a conference, for example, you may be thinking, okay, am I looking for someone who can act as a mentor or a role model? Can this be someone that I'm looking to help me with my professional development, right? Or my technical development? I used to do reaction progress kinetics, 
So if I was at a meeting, I wanted to meet other people who did kinetics, who looked at, you know, real-time IR or other types of spectroscopy that could be done in real time. Those are people that I thought, you know, they can connect with me on a technical level and they can help me in this technical area. So if I met someone who did that, my conversation would always be, hi, my name is Felicia. I'm a graduate student, blah, blah, blah. And I study this. I'm really interested in learning more about that technique that you do, right? And, and conferences can be easy, especially if you are at a poster session, because usually you can see this is what the person does. It could be a lot less easy if you're at a networking event where it's very informal. So maybe you're just there and there are lots of people there. And you may still be looking for someone who may be a mentor. And so what's usually good is if you can go to a networking event and there's like someone else. You take, I used to always take the buddy system that I take my extroverted friend because I know my extroverted friend is going to strike up conversations with any and everybody. And so I usually will leverage my extroverted friend to have conversations. And then when I hear something that may be of interest to me, I feel comfortable of jumping into that conversation. So Chandra is saying she does the same thing. This has literally helped me in a lot of situations. I think that my strength is, is that I'm very observant. So I spend a lot of time watching people, looking at how they interact with other people. And so I usually can tell, okay, I can go and talk to this person. They seem to be friendly. Um, they, you know, they, they're, they're going to be a good person for me to talk to. And we can talk about the weather, if that's all that I can think of at that time before we figure out kind of what our common interests are. Um, and so if you're looking for someone who could be a mentor, professional development, technical development, someone that can provide you meaningful feedback, sometimes you look at, you know, maybe professors, or you can leverage your professors to say, hey, I'm really looking to connect with someone who does this type of work. Do you know anyone that would be willing to connect with me? And so really think about who you currently have in your network who may be able to help you expand your network through their network. Again, also, are you looking for someone who can advocate or sponsor you? This all kind of falls under that mentorship um, kind of umbrella. Are you looking for an accountability partner? This is also very, very important. When I was in graduate school, I had friends who were accountability partners. They may not have been in the same group as me or in the same um, area of research as me, but we were able to kind of sit down and say, hey, so have you done these experiments that you said you were going to do? Or have you started working on your poster? Or have you started working? Those are things that I think are critically important for you to think about when you're networking with people, especially if you meet someone who's kind of at the same level that's a peer, that's at the same level or the same place that their journey at in their journey as you. It's a great way to become kind of to, to leverage or to maintain that relationship is to kind of act as accountability partners for each other. And then also emotional support. Right. I don't think we think about this enough of needing emotional support. And, and a lot of times our close friends and family kind of fall into that um, into that role of being the emotional support for us while we're going through our professional journey. But think about that. You may want to think about like I'm going to this event because I'm looking that for someone who's also kind of experiencing this thing that I'm experiencing. I'm looking for someone to be an emotional support. So I definitely think. The first step to really thinking about networking is to really be intentional and think about who am I trying to connect with. The second thing I always say is have an elevator speech ready. I'm sure you all have heard this a million times before, but it's really important because when you don't know what to say to people or if you don't know them, you can at least start with your elevator speech, right? So think about who am I, what do I do, what are my interests, and maybe include your interesting fact because if nothing else catches their eye, then telling them that like you climbed a mountain may spark a conversation. Um, so I kind of use this very kind of generic uh, thing for mine. I always say, hi, my name is, I am a organic chemist. I work for the American Chemical Society. I am interested in undergraduate chemistry education, right? What we put in those blanks really depends on our audience, right? Now, if I go to a, let's say I went to a Harry Potter enthusiast conference, I may not tell people that I'm an organic chemist that works at the American Chemical Society. 
I may say, say, okay, hi, my name is Felicia and I am a Ravenclaw. Like those things may change depending upon who your audience is, but really thinking about having several different um, kind of elevator speeches and being able to communicate um, and being able to communicate that those will be very critical for you all. So I see we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to kind of get us through this. Um, the next thing is to exchange contact info and follow up, right? It was great to meet you. Do you have a LinkedIn page or business card? Can I contact you if I have additional questions? This is really important because it's great to meet people, but if you don't do that follow up piece, then it's kind of a missed opportunity. So you really want to make sure that you're able to connect with them and find a way to follow up. Now, my advice would be don't search for people on social media outside of LinkedIn. I always say like people may have other social media avenues. They may be on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, but they may not be using those for professional purposes. They, those may be their personal networks. So you should always ask like, hey, what's your preferred mode of contact? Should I you know, email your work or should I connect with you on LinkedIn? Second is like follow up within two weeks of meeting. Um, and I usually say this because if you're at a conference, Usually people need a week after that conference to just decompress, right? If you go to a large event, people may just need time to decompress. And usually when you attend a conference or some other large event, you may collect a lot of business cards. You need to make a, a decision about who do I want to follow up with? Who do I not need to follow up with, right? And when you follow up with those individuals, you want to make sure that you send them an email and remind them who you are and where they met you because they may have also connected with a lot of different people um, over that course of that meeting or that conference. So your networking relationship should be mutually beneficial, right? Consider how you may be able to contribute to the person's growth development or provide access for them, right? Again, we don't wanna get into mentoring, or not mentoring, networking relationships where you are taking, 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 and not giving something in return. So please be sure that when you engage and you start connecting with people that you find ways that you can also be of a benefit to them or you can help them expand their network. And foster that relationship over time. It does not mean that if you meet someone that you need to talk to them every week, right? You, need, you, don't, you don't have to connect with them every week. But you may want to follow up with them once a quarter, once a year, just to say, hey, we talked about this thing. I just wanted to give you an update on how it's going. Um, I hope things are good with you moving forward, blah, blah, blah. I don't think, I think we live in a world now where we're so interconnected that I think it can be overwhelming to kind of constantly say like, oh, hey, like, can you do this for me or can you do that for me? And really kind of think about like, okay, how often do I really need to connect with this person in order for us to uphold this relationship? Again, I think I said this before, do not name drop or misrepresent your skills when networking. Again, people will find out. They will find out if you lie and say like, oh, I know, you know, me and the CEO of ACS are close friends. Yeah, someone's going to go back and say, do you know this person? They said they knew you. So don't misrepresent who you are. Don't try to name drop if you really don't know that person. Also, don't, do not volunteer someone else's network without their permission. I say this because you never know what other things someone may be dealing with. So for example, if I know someone, or recently I connected with a student who was really looking to connect with other analytical chemists. I'm not an analytical chemist, but I knew some. So before I said, oh, I'm gonna connect you with this person, I asked the other individuals like, hey, do you have the capacity or the bandwidth to kind of talk to this student who's interested in analytical chemistry? If not, that's fine. If so, that's great, right? So sometimes you wanna make sure that if you are acting as a connector, that you don't want to kind of volunteer someone else's network or their time when they may not actually have the time to, or the capacity to really commit to that uh, relationship. Finally, befriend an extrovert or let an extrovert befriend you. 
I know this sounds crazy, but literally it has been a strategy that has worked for me for at least the past 20 years is that I have to have at least one friend who's very social and very much so an extrovert because they'll make sure that I go out and go to different events and that I'm meeting new people. And also they usually have a very large network of people that they can connect you to. And so seriously, I can't say this enough. Use your extra, your extroverted friends can come in handy um, when attending networking events or attending other events. Because of time, I'm going to stop here. I really thought this wasn't going to go this long, but if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them. I think we have like three minutes for questions right now. Um, so if there are any questions or if there are questions on the app, I'll be happy to answer them in these last couple of minutes. Yes, yeah, so we have one question on the web board that I can see that I will ask, but I also just want to let you guys know that um, we can continue this discussion on a discussion board and ask our questions to Felicia um, over on the WOVA platform. It was absolutely an excellent presentation, and I think we all could probably ask you like 20 minutes worth of questions. So the question that we have over on the WOVA platform is how do you motivate yourself to make connections? I always feel so awkward. And I think you did um, give us a lot of good tips. We could probably go over that again real quickly. Yeah, I think that I think a lot of people find themselves in that position. And I think to some extent, you have to put yourself out there because you have to think about what are the what are the downfall, what's, what, what are the potential downfalls if I don't network, right? If I don't expand my network, if I don't put myself out there to kind of meet new people. I would also say start small, network with people who have similar interests as you, right? Use that as kind of your practice group, right? Use your close friends or people who may have interests, similar interests to you in smaller groups. I think for me personally, what really helped, I got really involved with uh, Nobache as a graduate student. And Nova Shea is much smaller than ACS, right? And so it was really great for me to kind of work with Nova Shea because then I was able to leverage those skills when it was time for me to work with a larger organization and think about how can I engage with this larger organization. So my advice in that is really to kind of start small and find an extrovert. That's a go-to. Any other questions? I think in the yeah. chat, we have about one more, um, sorry, let me turn my camera back on. So we just got one that says, what are some examples of bi-directional benefits you've used in networking when you've initiated the interaction? Right, so some of the bi-directional benefits, um, I would think uh, one is me and my friend, my friend Randy. She was actually introduced to me from another friend um, that I used to work with. And when we met, she was starting a new job. So I was actually able to help her initially with uh, kind of getting comfortable with the organization um, because I was already working there. I was help, help, to help her kind of bring her on. But at the same time, she was able to, she was a local to DC, but she was able to actually like help me meet a lot of people in the DC area. So it was beneficial from a sense of her being able to feel comfortable with the organization, but me also being able to expand my network, my network through her. I see people are sharing information in the chat. I don't want us to lose this. So Hannah, do you know if there's going to be a way to kind of move? Yes. And I will actually, um, I've copied and pasted them and I will post them on our WOVA platform board. So if that's okay with you, Anne and whoever, and Christine saved the chat, um, which will be a part of the recording as well. Um, when we post these, but uh, it is about time for us to wrap up. So I just wanna say thank you so much, um, Felicia, you've given us a lot of great tips. And um, I think this is an excellent uh, way for us to all learn how to network ourselves best as well. So thank you. And um, we can all head over to the uh, keynote with Valerie Young. Thank you everyone. It was great to interact with you all. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on the app.